Breakthroughs are those magic moments when a brand new way of thinking becomes suddenly clear. Consider some major breakthroughs in science, an expanding universe in astronomy, waves and particles in physics, continental drift in geology, DNA molecules in genetics, electrical impulses in the brain. All were startling theories when first introduced. Most are now commonly taught in high school. So what are the newest ideas floating around? What radically different scientific concepts will keep us dazzled and perplexed? Next, on Closer to Truth, what are the next breakthroughs in science? Welcome to Closer to Truth, I'm Robert Kuhn. So what can we expect in astronomy, in physics, biology, brain science, behavioral science? You really never know where or when a breakthrough will occur. So we invited a diverse group of distinguished scientists and thinkers to give us their best predictions. Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist at Princeton, is director of the Hayden Planetarium of the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. Francisco Ayala, an evolutionary biologist, is a former president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Patricia Churchland, a philosophy professor, has formulated 10 top questions about brain and mind. Timothy Ferris is the best-selling author of nine books, including Coming of Age in the Milky Way and The Whole Shebang. And Dr. Rochelle Gelman, is professor of psychology at UCLA, where she studies the changing thought of children. Neil, where do you expect breakthroughs in the next 10 years in astronomy? What's going to be discovered? Well, I, I'm not sure about how other, other sciences, uh, what enables them to predict. But I know that in astronomy and astrophysics, we get together as a community once per decade and prioritize mm. space missions uh, to advise Congress on which ways monies should be spent. And we are living in a time where very few breakthroughs come forth just by somebody sitting with pencil and paper. They come through flowing from that frontier of technology that builds us the bigger telescope, the better detector, that other part of the electromagnetic spectrum that hadn't been tested before. So You have to plan your breakthroughs. We plan our breakthroughs because they involve expensive mm -hmm. hardware mm -hmm. in order to do this. And by the way, that's... Which all of us on this panel are paying for, right? <laughs> that's right. The tax money <laughs> right. pays for nearly all of it. Right. That's right. And, and, and I think the fruits of that get good distribution throughout the magazines and newspapers. Mm -hmm. So we're all sort of participants in this cosmic discovery. But this is nothing new. Uh, the earliest discoveries in astronomy, the ones that really turned the world upside down, happened through the invention of the telescope and then bigger telescopes and bigger and bigger. So th th that pathway is nothing new. But it enables us to predict with some precision where breakthroughs might take place. And one, one of them is uh, there's something called the Space Interferometry Mission, SIM, it's called, which will, wh when it gets launched, it'll enable us to observe with unprecedented precision the locations of objects on the sky, which means if there's something making it move or vary, you can measure that with unprecedented precision as well. And these are the places that could be the sites of, of, of other planetary planet systems. systems, exactly, because the gravity of a planet right. uh, influences the motion of the, the host star. So you'll be looking at the distance from two separate uh, areas. That's correct. Two telescopes. To that's the interferometry means you, you're right. looking through a, over a baseline, and you're combining that information in such a way right. that it's as though you had a, a telescope of that diameter, but you get very high resolution. Uh, for, for, for the investment of monies. We'll be watching for that. Okay. Francisco, you've been called the Renaissance man of evolutionary biology, a title you'll never live down, I think. But this is due to your broad understanding of the philosophical implications, not just of the biology, but what the meaning is here. Uh, some scientists like to look at evolution as, as the singularly most important discovery in the history of science. Do you agree with that? I do. Yes. Why? Well, it opened up completely the explanation of organisms. Um, we did biology before Darwin only in trivial ways. And the fundamental questions all started with Darwin, which mm. makes it possible to ask why organisms are the way they are, why they are organized the way they are, how they function, how they relate, how they change. It changed time. our worldview. Completely. It is a, 
uh, you know, the, as I like to say sometimes, is the completion of the Copernican revolution. Copernicus uh, and, and, and Newton and, and the physicists in between uh, brought the world of physics into the world of science. Mm -hmm. the, the, what Darwin did is do the same thing for organisms. Right. So after Darwin, we can do biology. Yeah. Now, people today are though, taking the next step, and they're talking about evolutionary psychology and using evolution to explain everything from our appreciation of music and art to altruism and love. Do you explain uh, uh, psych well, human psychology through uh, biological evolution? Oh, you can explain much of human psychology, and I think there is a kind of altruism which has to do the relationships between, say, parents and children or relatives and the like that can be explained biologically. Now, true altruism, that is doing something that benefits others at a cost to me, right. that there we are out of biology. Yeah, but, the but there are some people trying to explain oh. it in, in, a, in, in what seems to be yeah. a, a very technical sense. Right, and, uh, and I spend a lot of my time writing against them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, I just don't want to be on the other side from you. Uh, Patricia, as a leading theorist in uh, the neurosciences, you are developing a top ten list of the core questions about the brain and the mind. Now, I know you're not trying to compete with David Letterman, but can you give us a little <laughs> bit of your top ten? All right. The one question which may surprise you is, is why we sleep and why we dream. Um, it's a remarkable thing that we spend about a third of our lives asleep, and why we do it is really not understood. Why the brain really seems to mm. need to sleep is, it remains a puzzle. And we know that the brain does need it because an animal kept alive, uh, kept awake for a long period of time, two or three days, has a tendency to die. And, uh, but exactly what the nature of the mechanism is and why it's so important isn't understood. Um, so that's one question. Another question has to do with the nature of neural development, how it is that you can uh, go from a fertilized egg to a fully developed human with a fully developed brain. And how the hun hundreds of billions of nerve cells all find their right connections. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that we are learning is that the old split of which much was made between nature and nurture it turns out to be much more complicated. I mean, as, as you know, most of the, the DNA it does not code for proteins. Most of it is regulatory. So much of what happens in development depends on when certain genes are turned on. And the environment, both within the, the organism itself but also outside of it, has a big influence on how the organism develops. And of course, once the organism is born, then the environment continues to have a big, have a big role. Tim, uh, in addition to uh, being a very distinguished author, you are what we call a generalist scholar. You've taught many subjects at the university. Is there a difference in the process, the creative process, when you have big science versus the fabled, the lone creative scientist? Well, I think there is. Um, Sir Fred Hoyle had a nice way of putting this. He said that the the trouble with a big laboratory, running a big laboratory, is that you can't go fishing on Friday afternoon because you have meetings scheduled. And that's a pity because it's when you're out fishing that you come up with the good ideas right. that carry your research forward. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with big science, but as uh, Freeman Dyson likes to, to say, it's sort of like an ecology. A healthy science should contain some big projects and some middle-sized and some small ones. But uh, the, the, the most dangerous kind of project, uh, really, in science or technology is the big project in which national prestige has been tied up, because then that can't fail. And an experiment that can't fail is, is almost doomed. And that's almost non-science. Rochelle, uh, you are a cognitive psychologist who has expanded our knowledge of how children think and babies count. I want you to do something for me.